This is our place, come on in. Our place, so glad you're here. Our place, everybody's welcome. We see God on every face. Love lives here in this place. Welcome to our place, our sweet place. Greetings, everyone, on this very first Sunday of December 2021. Wow. The theme for this month is light. Because light is that very thing that flows through each of us. So the whole month is going to be about shining your light. I'm Reverend Jody Hill Stevenson, the senior minister here. And I'm so happy that you've joined us here at the Center for Spiritual Living Boulder Valley. We're actually part of a worldwide organization where we share the concept of oneness and of love and creation and all that allows us to shine brightly as individualized expressions of the one. That's what we're here for. That's why we came to this planet. So we have a very special service plan today. Um, you all know and love our speaker. You've asked for him over and over and over and he's here today um, from California. And he's also a very dear friend. Thanks for being here. Welcome. My name is Laura Brzezinski and I'm today's practitioner. Please join me in reciting our BHAG. We reflect the divine through teaching the science of mind principles of success as we co-create an inclusive, inspiring, global online ministry. This white candle beside me represents the light in each of us. It is always right here within us. Here are some words of inspiration for today from our founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes. <clears throat> no one can rob us of our own soul and our spirit is already one with the internal, eternal goodness. From Wayne Dyer, the idea of the soul is space, immensity. The one thing it needs is to be free to expand and embrace the infinite. And you can pretend to be something other than who you are, but eventually you will run out of energy to continue because that's not authentically you. From Carolyn Miss. Our affirmation today I am soul on earth. I learn and teach. I help and need help. I love and am loved. And my personal power lies in knowing there is no me to protect in the true nature of spirit. Only God is real. Let's take a moment to close our eyes, turn within and just breathe this in. We 
Hallelujah. Let's go within and pray. Uh, and I breathe in this moment. I breathe in the light and the life that is spirit, that is breathing me in each and every moment and is breathing you and every being on this planet. For spirit is infinite and is everywhere in everything in every moment and from this place of of one with all of life i just know for each person that consciousness that awareness that all is well that each person's life is unfolding beautifully in divine timing with lessons with challenges with joys with inspiration with laughter, with fun, with questions, with all sorts of things, goodness, that makes life rich. And I know and affirm that, that this community is growing and building and connecting, sharing the message of oneness, sharing the message of love and joy and kindness and purpose all around this planet. And for this, I am so grateful, grateful to be right here in this moment, holding this knowing. Grateful to be connected to each and every person listening. Grateful for the divine connection that we have right here in our hearts and in our minds. <clears throat> for we are all connected to that divine source. And so I just release and let go, knowing that all is well. Life is unfolding beautifully, magnificently, in the most wondrous ways. And I affirm, and so it is. And you 
speaker is someone near and dear and lives very deep in my heart. He's one of those guys that you just love calling a soul brother. Dr. Jonathan Ellerby is a two-time bestseller author. He travels the world speaking. He is absolutely one of, if not the best storyteller. I've watched him take audiences and just mold them in his hands. And he is such a wise sage. Dr. Jonathan, thank you for joining us from California. We miss you here in Denver, but we support you in your next chapter. Thanks so much for being here. Let me introduce to you, Dr. Jonathan. Greetings, my dear friends at CSL Boulder Valley. It's Dr. Jonathan. Again, some of you have heard me before and some of us have even met. I am honored to be invited back. Uh, so grateful for your community, uh, for Reverend Jody, for everyone involved there. Thank you one and all for your invitation and your warm welcome. Uh, let's just dive right in, shall we? Uh, I'd like to begin with just catching our breath a little bit. So wherever you're viewing this, whether it's live, uh, watching the recording with others in the community, or whether it's later watching the recording, um, who knows where, on your phone, on a plane, uh, on a boat, on a car, sounds like a Dr. Seuss, doesn't it? It's always good to just stop, catch our breath and find our center before we open our hearts and minds to new ideas or new ways of hearing old familiar things. With that, I encourage you to close your eyes just now Sit comfortably but alert. And you may like to place your right hand over your heart, your left hand over your belly. What science tells us is this posture has all the neurological and physiological benefits of a hug. But symbolically, this is also a way to honor oneself, to touch our hearts, and if to remember there is more than our thinking doing lives, to touch our bellies as if to affirm our gut feeling, our intuition, our deeper knowing. From this place, I encourage you to draw a deep, slow breath. 
hold it just a moment. And then really exhale through the mouth to your fullest capacity. When you reach the edge of that breath, draw a soft breath back in through your nose. Hold it for a moment and exhale long and slowly to absolute completion. In this way, we affirm that letting go is perhaps the most important part of receiving. Letting go of judgment, letting go of preference, letting go of control, and finding the ways that God, spirit, life is speaking to us through everything everything that is around us, within us, and happening for us. So when you're ready, you can open your eyes and join me as we go back in time, long, long time ago and far, far away. And this is the story of a great queen, a great empire, but more so, it's the story of a wisdom keeper. You see, when the queen became queen, she inherited the throne from her father at a young age. You might imagine maybe as a late teen. And at that time, she inherited his most trusted senior advisor, the king's hand, you might say. And this advisor had been with the king for, for ages, in fact, perhaps since he was young. And this trusted advisor was known for his, his wisdom, his intelligence, his kindness, his breadth of knowledge, his depth of character. You get the idea. He was a pretty exceptional human. But of course, if he knew the queen from the time she was born and became her advisor when she was a late teen, at a certain point, as she grew older and into the fullness of her leadership, he came to the sunset of his time as the royal advisor. And so they set up a great contest where they called across the land to find who would be the next great wisdom keeper, the next advisor to the queen. Well, this can be a pretty long story, but let's keep it short for today. They search near and far, high and low. They have contests and all kinds of competitions, but it all comes down to three great minds, three great hearts that are brought together before the queen. Huge crowds outside the castle watch and wait as she greets them and meets these three final contestants. And she says to the three of them, clearly you are the brightest, the wisest, the most genius, and perhaps even the most caring and kind that we could find in this whole country. And so I'm sending you all to my deepest, darkest dungeon. Everyone gasps. The dungeon, anything but the dungeon, right? This, this dungeon, everyone knows that the cells are impenetrable, that no one has ever escaped. And what a strange turn of events. Why did she feel so threatened by them? Why would she send them to this fate? So there they go, each one put in a cell, one beside the other. But the queen was up to something, for behind the cells, there was a hidden chamber, a kind of tunnel in which through a sliver, a crack in each of the three cells, one could peer in to see what was going on. I kind of think about the old Scooby-Doo TV show, if some of you remember that. There was always a, a great big painting in the middle of the, of the great room, wherever the mystery was taking place, and the eyes were cut out of one of the paintings as someone, usually the bad guy, right, was like looking through the eye holes, something like that. And so the queen, her advisors, her council, they're all in the tunnel, shh, shh, watching. 
and they look through one sliver. Oh, this is the one. This is the one you're going to choose. They were so excited. Look at this guy. He's gathering tiny little pieces, fragments of things that he finds. A little piece of bone, a little piece of hair, even something that looks like wire or metal. Oh yes, he's gonna create some tool or device, maybe pick the lock or, or dig away at something, who knows, but this guy's onto something. So they scuttle over to the next uh, location and there through the next sliver, they see the next contestant. Oh, and this guy, very impressive. He's calculating, scratching into the wall and on the floor measurements and numbers. He's, he's estimating the depth of the bricks and the, the, the weight of the bars and, and where the wind is coming from and the, uh, you know, where might there be a ways to escape and so on. He's, he's analyzing everything. Well, that's obviously going to be the great wisdom keeper. Who could be that smart to calculate all this? And then they go to the middle and they look through the little sliver there. And some of the council starts snickering and laughing. What's she doing? This is absurd. This is, this is going nowhere. Let's get out of here. The queen says, wait, just wait. And there they see the third contestant, a woman sitting cross-legged in the middle of the cell with her eyes closed. Is she meditating? Is she praying? What is she doing? She's hopeless. She's doing nothing at all. But they wait and they watch. And then suddenly she stands up, she walks to the door and she pushes it open. It was never locked at all. And I like to share this story as an important beginning to what may be a simple, but for me, important message that I want to share today. We've all heard the saying that we are not human beings on a spiritual journey. Instead, we are spiritual beings on a human journey. But I believe that too often we hear that through a worldview that already supposes that the soul is something we as humans have, that the soul is something that we as humans might believe in, that the spiritual journey is somehow something we can choose or not. And so many of us hear this expression, spiritual beings on a human journey. And what we kind of interpret it to mean is that being human is spiritual. But I'd like to argue that it's, it's something much deeper and more clear, more distinct, more dramatic, that in many ways, like the prisoners, the wisdom keepers in these cells, in these stories, there is something that lives, you might say, trapped inside a world that we've come to believe. Like the wise prisoners, they believed their cells were real. They believed that the queen's authority was absolute. But in these kinds of tales, we have to think mythically. We have to look symbolically. And the royalty, in some ways, even if benevolent, always signifies the ego. And in this case, the prison cell, our experience of life. And so the ego casts us into a story of life that we have wrongly come to believe, that somehow life is defining us, is more powerful than us, and that who we are, what we are, is at the whims and the mercy of the ego itself. If I believe in the soul, if I believe in the spiritual journey, if I remember that I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. But I would argue that the most important way to hold this 
admonition that we are spiritual beings on a human journey, and I do believe the way it has been intended time and time again, is for us to remember that we are spirit beings in a human dimension, which means we existed before we came here. And like a cell, which we may negotiate much more freely than we ever thought a life that we may, that may appear to be full of traps, but is in fact filled with the opportunity to, for freedom, that we will enter this life, we will experience it as a soul in a human context for the evolution of the soul that we are, and then we will exit. Now, that may seem pretty close to what you already believe or think, but I want you to hear it again. We are spirit beings in a human dimension, which means we do not have souls. We are souls, and our souls have a human life. And in my way of seeing it, even the personality itself is only a dimension of the soul allocated into this life. And the soul itself is a consciousness, an energy that is evolving and learning, evolving and learning as we go. Dimension after dimension, possibly life after life through the metaphysical universe. So we are consciousness evolving in a human experience. Now, why is that so important to know? Well, it's really important to know for some very practical and mundane reasons. The first is that if you know you are a soul, then you know that you are not anything that you have. Whatever you have, you are not. And I don't just mean a car, a house, a pension, a friend, a meal, but I mean a body, a mood, a thought. We may influence these things. We may make choices in these things and thus take ownership of them, but they do not own us. When we know that we are a soul, then we can witness absolutely any and every aspect of our lives. We can witness thoughts, witness emotions, witness reactions, witness habits, addictions. And from the soul's perspective, we can simply say, wow, so this is what fear feels like. Wow, so this is what love feels like. Wow, this is what aging feels like. Oh, this is what hunger feels like. The soul is here to experience the fullness of the human life, but the work is not being identified with the human life. And one of the ways that we often come to confusion is believing that the human life purpose is what defines the soul's fulfillment. Do I have a legacy? Did I make my mark? Do I have the right job? Am I studying the right things? But I would say, that's not really it either. That a purpose defined by doing is a part of that human dimension. Important, yes. And yes, may that purpose of doing be reflective of the soul that we are, the personality that we've taken on, the authentic self that we are here to know and explore and integrate. But any purpose that is a purpose of outer doing is a purpose that someone can take from us. Fighting for a cause, building something, creating something, whatever that might be, it can be taken and it will diminish or vanish over time. I do believe that the true soul's purpose, as many of you believe, is to grow and to evolve through the perception 
of human purpose, through the perception of human relationship, through the perception of the human experience. In fact, what I'd like to conclude with is the idea, the belief, the conviction, that there are four things that every soul is here to do, four purposes that no one can take to, from you. There are four purposes of being a soul in a human experience. And they are quite simple, although not always that easy to fulfill or understand. These are four purposes that can be embraced no matter what we do, no matter where we go, no matter what happens to us. And that is to learn, to help, to love, and to be. To learn, to help, to love, and to be. Now here's the tricky thing. They sound simple enough. I like to learn, I'm a helper, I love love, and of course I believe in embracing life and being. Sounds easy. But let's look again. For the fullness of each is absolute, which means these are absolute purposes, absolute projects, absolute, uh, absolute work. There is never a moment where you cannot apply or explore these four things. So to learn means to learn from absolutely everything, absolutely everything, including the things you most dislike, reject, and disdain. And more than that, the deeper work of learning is to learn, to be okay, to be learned from. And what that means is you do the best you can as the soul that you are. And what others make of it is their business, their learning, not yours. Too much of our lives are shaped around trying to create the experience of others, to shape the experience of others, and more so to shape other people's experiences of us and what we think we're here to teach. But what you're here to teach is none of your business. So learning is about learning from everything and being okay with being learned from. That means being in authenticity and integrity. The second, to help. It means to move from fixing to healing. And when you move from fixing to healing, then you begin from a place that doesn't know. You don't know what people need. You don't know what's right for them. You begin by listening, listening to stories, feeling energy, being present, being loving, being open. And one of the greatest ways you will enrich your ability to be that healer, to be present, to be listening, is to learn to be helped. Because when we live in the consciousness of fixing, there is the broken and there is the fixer, and that is a world of division. But when you live in the world of healing and helping, we come to see that we are all in need in some moment or another, and we all need each other. And when we are on the journey of helping, we are helped by those in need, for we ourselves are also always in need in some way or another, of lessons, love, and so on. The third is love. And love, of course, sounds good, but once again, we're talking about offering your depth of kindness, compassion, care, to absolutely everything and everyone without exception. And that's some hard work. And what helps it is learning to be loved. So the real work of love is not just outgoing care, but it's absolute compassionate acceptance of all and receiving the loving care of others. To be loved is to know how to love. To truly know how to love is to be able, willing 
to receive love fully. And finally, being and, as Shakespeare would say, uh, to be and not to be. The true work of being is both embracing the fullness of life and releasing it completely, moment after moment. You embrace every learning, every helping, every loving, every experience that arises and falls within you, and you release all of it from attachment. The true work of being is learning how to die while we are alive, learning to let go of absolutely all attachment, identity, condition, so that we are in fact liberated to love, help, learn, and be this human experience completely, without judgment, without shame, without fear. And these four practices, learning and being learned from, helping and being helped, loving and being loved, being and non-being, or embracing and releasing life. These are the four elements of a soul's work that will carry you into the most extraordinary experience of life, fulfillment, meaning, connection, peace, and for sure, wholeness, healing, awakening. So this, my friends, is what I really wanted to leave you with today. Consider that too often, like, like those wisdom keepers in those prison cells, we are trying to solve the wrong problems. Rather than going in and listening for that deeper work, learning, helping, loving, being, we're busy solving questions that don't even matter. We're busy fighting fights that don't even exist. We're busy trying to solve our way out of a trap that we are not even in. The purpose is not outside there. The purpose is in here. And the truth of who and what we are as souls is inextinguishable, unbreakable, and something beautiful that no one can take from us ever. So. With that, I thank you. I thank you for your blessing. And may we remember in our hearts, I am a soul evolving. I am here to learn and be learned from. I am here to help and be helped. I am here to love and be loved. And I am here to embrace and release life fully. Amen. Thank you. And thank you for having me with you again. Take care. If you'd like to reach out to me, I'm easy to find online. And I look forward to connecting down the road. Bye-bye. of the ages there are challenges and changes everywhere we see and it's hard to trust even the best of us can lose our way that's why I'm here to say I'm gonna hold you Till you know again that everything's all right, and I'll remind you as you are, you are enough. Gonna hold you in the light. Alone.
the time for our giving. And this is one of my favorite parts of any service because it's a time when we can actually physically know that we live in a loving, trusting, prosperous universe, that, that the, that the uh, universe really has our back and we get to give in order to receive. And then we receive and then we give, and then we give, and then we receive, and, and the dance goes on as circular. The Center for Spiritual Living Boulder Valley is indeed a spiritual community, and we honor all paths of life, and we actually exist to remind each other that we are individualized expressions of the divine. So if you would take your energy, um, either your checks or your energy, if you pay online, if you donate online, and repeat with me, this perfect gift is spirit and form, circulating and blessing all that it touches, freely I give and joyously I receive, and so it is. And I just want to add, I am so grateful for your generosity. We just keep moving along here, and it's because of you. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to remind you, this community is supported by a prayer team of practitioners. We would love to pray with and for you. Please find our contact information on the website and reach out if you'd like support through a challenge or or just celebrating a win. So that's it for our service today. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, practitioners. Thank you for everybody for joining us. 
um, it's such a joy to have a spiritual tribe that loves and supports us in all the different things that we all go through. Know that love lives here. And this community is here for you. So let us know. Go out and have a great week. Shine your light and especially shine your light from your heart to the one in the mirror. Have a great one, everyone. Bye now. And please join me in saying our benediction together. I now walk so that whoever walks beside me dwells in the presence of God. I now listen so that whoever speaks with me knows that I hear the voice of God. Whoever places a hand in mine is lifted, and whoever thinks of me is illumined with God consciousness. For spirit and I are one eternally, and so it is. Oh!